Oh, wait, so it's doing... No, no, no. Okay, good. All righty. Let me see how we're doing here. And we seem to be okay. Let me just open this down at the bottom. Okay, hello. Hi, hi, hi. Um, I'm Tad. You are whoever you are. I'm whoever I am. Somehow we're all going to work that out. Let me see what I'm doing here with this. Let's see if we can change this light fixture just a little bit. No, we don't want to go that way. We want to go this way. Why is it doing this? Okay, well, that will have to do. Um, anyway, good to see you all. A uh, pleasure, as always, to share time with you. Um, I will be reading more from Brothers of the Wind. And that's basically it. I don't have a lot to talk about this week, just because, as I mentioned last night, um, it was just not that kind of a week where much work could get done, unfortunately. Um, not complaining about that. It's just a fact, a fact of life. But uh, that's how it works. Um, sometimes you work, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you run around in circles. You spend hours on the phone with insurance agents or medical stuff or whatever. And this last week was one of those. So, again, as I said, not complaining, just talking. Um, and I'm still in the middle of a very fiddly little bit of finishing up the manuscript. Fiddly, fiddly, fiddly. I was talking to Deb about it uh, yesterday or the day before saying, you know, the problem with this part of the job is it's work. And I don't actually like work. Uh, <laughs> I would have become a worker for a living. I mean, yeah, writing is work. It's always work. But there are some parts that are more work-like than others. And fiddling around with phases of the moon and uh, all that kind of stuff is definitely more like work. It's more like math. And I was not a math guy in school. You know, I did what I had to do to graduate, but uh, it was never my favorite. Anyway, let me just check in. I see a few people have showed up already, so let me say hello. So Ray is at the top. Ray Weatherford, hello, Ray. Good to see you. Uh, Kelly has checked in. Kelly Kenrick, hello, good evening. Good to see you, Kelly. Um, Medardo, Medardo, and to give Medardo, of course, his full and very fine name, Medardo Landon Maza Dueñas. Um, and what do I think of the Hollywood strike? Medardo wants to know. What I think about is I'm always on the side of the creators, and I'm usually on the side of the workers against the bosses. Um, I know from uh, my own personal experience that the corporate folks always get more of our money than they probably really deserve. And while we are grateful <laughs> for for the assistance in finding a market, um, you know, the, the stories of creators who have gotten very little of their production or, or creation or whatever um, are, are absolutely, you know, it's a list miles long. So my, my first response is always to support um, support the workers, support creatives, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if that's what you're asking, I'm st strictly in favor. And actually, it's kind of really re interesting. Uh, I just saw a thing the other day on Spotify and how much people are actually being paid for uh, Spotify plays, you know, and these are musicians, obviously, mostly. Um, but, you know, they're getting like point zero zero something, you know, for for you know, the, uh, for each play, um, which is, you know, just crazy. You know, you need, you need a thousand plays even to earn a dollar for some of these things. Um, and the same is true. There's a, because of the people who are traditionally, whenever there's a strike by anybody who is perceived to make money, whether they are athletes, actors, whatever the case may be, um, there are always a bunch of people who are like, oh, uh, millionaires just want to be multimillionaires, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a bunch of Hollywood uh, actors who've been posting their residuals, you know, and they're getting like 17 cents for a, a you know, commercial they were in, or they're getting, you know, 26 cents for, uh, you know, the, the re-showing of an episode of a sitcom they were in or whatever. Um, so don't always, I, not, I don't think the people who probably listen to me are the types that jump to that conclusion, but don't, don't jump to the conclusion that everybody is getting rich except you. 
um, and especially not in this particular system that we're in. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm still pretty much a capitalist. I'm, I'm, I, I believe that, that there is value in competition um, in a number of ways. My main thing is I'm the kind of democratic socialist type guy who wants a better safety net and wants more equality and evenness in the playing field. Um, I don't want to get rid of capitalism. I think there's value from, from ideas competing against each other and things like that. But it's just that losing the competition should not get you killed if you are a human being in the 21st century. It should not mean that you are starving to death or you don't have medical care or whatever. Not everybody can win in a competition. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, of competition. And I don't mind some people getting more. I don't mind people getting more than me. That's okay too. That's, that's not the issue. Uh, my issue is the people who are left out of those particular things because for whatever reasons, connections, native ability, bad luck, who cannot compete in the marketplace. And I do not, do not at all support the idea that, um, you know, that, that the marketplace should determine everything. That's a nightmare. So anyway, that's my answer, Madarto. I hope that kind of gives you a, a feeling. I'm sure there's nothing surprising there to any of my regular friends, listeners, and readers. Although I did have somebody on, on um, I wrote something snippy about Elon Musk on Twitter um, after he called Mark Zuckerberg a cuck, which is just the most disgustingly pathetic incel type insult to give anybody. For those who don't know what it means, cuck obviously is short for cuckold and it implies that you are not manly enough. First of all, it implies you're a man. Second of all, it implies that you're not manly enough to keep your own spouse or partner or whatever, you know, and it's just the most childish, childish incel kind of crap. And I posted something about that. It was mostly a joke. You know, I just said, oh my God, the, the incel calls are coming from inside the house or something like that. Um, you know, as a joke on the old horror movie trope, and and one of the one of the people on on Twitter just totally blew up. I mean, he got really upset. You know, way to way to alienate you know half your readership and blah blah blah. And I'm, did I say there was something wrong with half my readership, or did I say that Elon Musk was being a jerk? Anyway, not to rehash all this because this crap happens all the time. But you know, the this person just really got fired up, and I wrote back to them said, you know, I don't understand how you could read my fiction if you actually do and not perceive my general, <laughs> my general political take on life. You know, I mean, it's, it seems to me it's pretty straightforward in all my work. I'm on the side of people. I'm on the side of, um, you know, the, that, that power, uh, attempts to control history and attempts to rewrite itself as though it were, you know, uh, fair and just and handed down from God and that the rich will always dominate the discussions and they will always demonize the poor. And, you know, I mean, that's history tells us that that's not anything particularly, you know, extreme or, 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 or odd to believe in. If you read history, you know, this has been going on as long as humans have been around, you know, the power the powerful dominate the weak. And in most cases, they do their best to keep that dynamic in place. So I don't think there's anything particularly startling to any of my readers that I am generally on the side of the powerless and um, I am not big on bullying or cruelty or any of those things. And those are all, that's in my work. How can you not see that? So if you could read my work, I'm not even sure this person actually did read my work. Because a lot of the criticisms I've gotten over the years seem to have come from people who literally didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, there are legitimate criticisms to be made about my work. Don't get me wrong. I'm not setting myself above it. But, you know, I mean, I, I had somebody once talk to me about being part of the, you know, the sort of white guy army that was trying to prevent or, or, or was ob oblivious to the idea of multiculturalism and stuff like this. And I was like, God, have you ever read anything of mine? Have you ever read the other land books or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And in this same, ca in this case, in this Twitter little mini controversy, it was the same thing. It was, I was like, how could you not know what my politics were, at least in a general sense? 
from reading. How could you possibly see anything else in my work or, or con convince yourself that, you know, I was some kind of, you know, arch conservative America firster. I've never been that person. I could never be that person. Anyway, this is not to get into a long thing. I said I wasn't going to use this forum for question for uh, talking about politics, and I'm not going to use this forum for talking about politics, but I just found that particularly amusing in the past week. And it, unfortunately, it also blew over onto Deb's page as well, and, and she got a bunch of stick from this guy. And it was, you know, it was just like, what a waste of energy, you know? I mean, there's lots of writers who I like who I don't agree with politically. Um, and some of them I disagree with very strongly, but I... I I certainly am not shocked and surprised that they are different politically than I am. It's pretty obvious from their work. Um, and again, I'm not going to name names because I was going to try and not make this political. Um, but anyway, so that's just on my mind. So that was my very long, multi-part, drawn out, four volumes when it should have been a trilogy version of my answer to your question, Medardo. Um, okay, Jeremy says, hi, checking in briefly as he needs to cook fish. Well, go cook that fish, Jeremy, and I appreciate your presence always. It's nice to hear from you. Barban checks in. Hello. Good to see you, Barban. Felina, hello. And she says hello to fellow listeners. Susan Shamblin checks in. Cheers and thank you, she says. Hope all is well with your dad. He is currently, he has moved on. The good thing is he has um, not moved on in, in any larger sense. But he has gone from the ICU, where he was when we were really scared, to the um, next step, which is, you know, a less, uh, less um, elevated level of freak out. And he is now moved out of the hospital entirely, and he's uh, doing a few days at a uh, therapy place uh, to get him so that he, he'll be comfortable on his own again you know, and without people helping him get up and sit down and all that kind of stuff. So that's what he's doing. It's all good so far. Um, it's certainly what we were hoping would happen. Um, so that's the answer. So thank you for asking, Susan, appreciate it. Um, and I haven't talked to him yet today, but last I saw he was in pretty good shape and in good spirits. Um, let me see, who else have I not said hello to? Becca, hello. You're very welcome. I'm always happy to read for you. Claudia, hello, hello. Same thing to you. Hello, good to see you. Emily Bell. Um, bum, 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 bum. Thank you, Emily. Emily has a lot of complicated but kind things to say. Um, this, There were parts where I was writing this book where I had to consciously veer away from um, things like Remains of the Day, which has some, some similarities and is a very fine book um, pre precisely because it's got those things in it family sacrifice tragedy choices and harm of course one could make the case that these things come up in many many situations but particularly in uh, remains of the day and I believe artist of the floating world um, the uh, the author in both of those is dealing with a fundamentally similar thing to what I'm dealing with which is that a person who has been made part of someone else's family in a sense begins to realize that that family is maybe not quite the exemplars that he thought they were um, and you know just getting getting a deeper and more complex look at things that had been taken for granted was very much uh, a part of this story and why i wanted to tell it especially because one of the things that led me to writing um, the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn books in the first place was my irritation with people who followed Tolkien but did not understand, I've said this before, did not understand that Tolkien was making actual choices about which parts of folklore and myth he wanted to work with and what philosophies he wanted to use. They were his own choices, which is splendid and one of the reasons that the Lord of the Rings reverberates so because the main themes were very powerful themes for Tolkien. But with these books, with my books and with all of my books, you know, I, I believe very strongly that I have to write something that resonates for me. And as a result, um, you know, it's, it's going to be different than Tolkien because I am a different person in a different era than Tolkien. Um, but a lot of the other writers, when I was starting out, didn't seem to see that. They seemed to 
look at Tolkien as being somebody who had essentially set the pattern that had to be followed, which I think would have horrified him um, if he had seen that next generation of fantasy knockoffs. And as a result, you know, I, I had no urge to do that. Um, I instead wanted to talk about it. And one of the things, this is actually coming back to the, the remark, um, one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about um, was the idea that since, unlike Tolkien, I am not of a uh, religious caste and I do not have that religious upbringing, um, Tolkien was very Catholic, um, I, I do not have a strong, necessarily, I have a strong belief that there was a golden age, which is kind of, you know, that's kind of built into the Judeo-Christian tradition that, you know, there was a golden age when humans were perfect and life was perfect and they lived in paradise and then that they somehow screwed up and got thrown out. So this idea of a fallen world, I, I don't believe in that. And one of the things that I wanted to do in this these books, and this is the first trilogy, was to deal with this idea of the fallen world and have it start out looking like that, like everybody else's version of Tolkien's fallen world. You know, oh, things were great back in the golden age, and now they are bad. And I wanted to pick away at that and have Simon in... In, in character as the, the, the viewer's stand-in or the reader's stand-in. I wanted Simon to pick away at some of those things and learn that what he had been taught wasn't necessarily true and that even the Sithi, who are the equivalent of Tolkien's elves, were not necessarily either not honest with themselves about the past. So because of that, there's a lot of these kinds of things that were very important to me and were a big part of, of these books. And so they carry over into the, um, the related books, including the new Tetralogy and these two shorter books that go with it. So that's another reason that um, the conflicts that arise in this is that this guy, this main character, Pamon Kess, is just beginning to realize that he has maybe just swallowed, uh, you know, uh, an entire history that is not entirely trustworthy and that it's more complicated than that. Let's put it that way. Anyway, uh, Jack Barucha. Again, I'm probably mispronouncing that name, but hello. Good to see you and thank you for the kind words. I like that. That's very nice. Thank you. I like Nezeru and Soja too, or Nezeru or Nezeru. Um, Winter waves quickly. Hello, Winter. Goodbye, Winter. Um, also, yeah, Vieki, poor Vieki. He has a tie. He has almost gotten killed so many times. He's been almost executed so many times. He deserves a little slack. Uh, Cliff, hi, Cliff. Good to see you. Calvin, hi. Good to see you too. Hope you're both well. James, a pleasure as always. Good to see you. Carl Dersham, hello, hello. Greetings. Tim Speckins, oh, shush, Walter. That's, go away. Somebody come and take this horrible animal, please. Um, <laughs> that's the Chihuahua. He's pissed off because his his boy, who with whom he lives almost all the time, is taking a shower or something. Um, let me see who I haven't, haven't I said hello to yet. Carl, I just saw. Tim Speckens, hello, hello. Good to see you. Angie, hello, hello. And who else? Anybody I haven't seen yet? Karen Grennan, hello, Karen. You bought the Grim Oak Tail Chaser song. It is gorgeous, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. Not that I'm going to get much of it because that's not how books work, but I'm always glad when people are supporting um, my work and the work. Um, 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 um. Okay. Yeah, that was Walter. <laughs> James chips in. Walter, a Walter sighting. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do after having said hello to the folks who checked in, or at least as best I could, I am going to start reading because it's already almost 20 minutes after. Um, and what we were, where we were at the last time when I was reading last night is Hakatri, his uh, squire, for lack of a better word, his armager, uh, Pamon Kess, and his brother Inaluki have all ridden north to the end of the mountains, and they have come to the castle of Zaniko, who is a, we would say Norn. He is Hikadaya, but he is an exile from Nakiga. He also didn't get along too well with the Sithi, and they disinvited him as well. 
So he has taken up residence with his changeling wife. And remember, changeling means Tanuka Daya, like Pamon Kess. The first night that they're there, um, the first night that they're there, Pamon Kess has gotten up to wander around because he's full of anxiousness because um, Lady Ona, who is Zaniko's wife, has spoken to him in Tanuka Daya, which he himself never learned. And she is kind of surprised by this. And so he's, this has been bothering him. He goes out for a ride, for a walk through the castle and discovers Inaluki, Hakatri's brother, apparently uh, with a, 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 a female, a woman of some kind, sort of uh, pinned up against a wall and worried, frightened for the, 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 the woman. Um, Inaluki has sort of lied, not sort of, he's lied. He said that, that uh, Hakatri wants to see Inaluki immediately. And to, but as soon as that happens, well, I will read and we will see it from there. So starting with Brothers of the Wind. Inaluki flicked his fingers in a gesture of annoyance, then turned away from the hooded figure and went past me down the stairs without a backward glance. When I turned, the female figure was already moving swiftly down the hallway. She opened a creaking door and shut it behind her. Not quite certain what I had interrupted, and sick with worry about what would happen when my, master, when my master's brother learned of my deception, I made my way up to the roof of the keep. The wind outside was fresh and strong. It had blown away the mists so that the stars shone fiercely. As I sometimes did, I wondered what the stars of the Lost Garden had been like. I knew many of their names, of course. My master's people talk about them almost as much they, as they do the stars under which we live now, in the way that the names of relatives both living and dead are mixed together in conversations about old family gatherings. I wondered if the garden star, named Light of Joy, had been truly as brilliant as the oldest Zedaya claimed, or if fond memory had colored their recall in the same way my own memories of childhood were warmed and made into something sacred because it was now lost to me. Something large and dark swept through the sky above me then, blotting out the stars where it passed and startling me so that I took several steps back from the tower rampart. It was not a winged dragon, as my weary, strained imagination had thought in that fearful moment, but only a large raven flying close above me. It landed a few paces away and strutted in a wide circle making disapproving sounds, then spread its broad wings, shook them, and flew across the tower top to one of the parapets at the far side. I could not see where it landed in the darkness, but I heard several other croaking voices and guessed it had joined others of its kind there. I stood for a while, listening to them, until they had quieted and then an even longer time enjoying the silence. The night air cooled my face, and seemed to cool my unsettled thoughts as well, and my heart had just found its proper pace again when someone behind me spoke, surprising me so much that I jumped. Armager Pamon, there you are. My master's people can be as silent as shadows when they wish. Like a guilty child caught with a piece of stolen fruit, I was terrified to meet Inaluki's eye, but I forced myself to turn. Y yes, my lord. Did my brother truly send you for me? I thought so, my lord. If I was wrong, I can only beg your pardon. He told me he wanted to see me tomorrow morn, not tonight. He did not sound as angry as I had feared. Something else seemed to have distracted him since we spoke on the stairs. I, I can only offer my apologies, my lord. I must have misunderstood. No doubt, no doubt. His tone suggested he was not convinced. But uh, bide here a while, Pamon. After that, he remained silent for a long, worrisome time, so that I quailed inside at what might be coming. Inaluki seldom addressed me at all unless it was to give me an order or ask me a question about something Hakatri wanted or had said, so I could think of no reason he would keep me except to punish me for my interference. My brother, 
he began at last, sounding oddly reluctant. My brother cannot. Pamon, if you care for him, you must convince him to return to Aswa. I was astonished by this, that instead of raging at my interference on the stairs, he should set me instead such an impossible task. Me, my lord, that is not my place. You can speak to him that way, but me? No, I cannot speak to him that way, said Inaluki bitterly. Do you doubt that I have tried? He will not heed me. He is determined to protect me from my own prideful foolishness. He loves you. That is not a reason for him to die. I was shocked, chilled. I had never heard my master's brother speak in this familiar way as if I were one of his own family, and it seemed an ill omen. Pray do not even say such a thing, my lord. There is no hope for it. I can think of nothing else. Since I made that cursed oath, I have felt doom hanging over us. Then take it back, Lord Inaluki. He laughed. It was not a pleasant sound. It is nothing so simple. When you declare yourself to the powers that watch over our world, over all worlds, you cannot simply turn around again and say, I did not mean it. Forget my words. Fate or whatever name you choose to give those powers, has already heard you. Like a great millstone driven by a rushing river, the engines that force our actions have begun to grind, and they cannot so easily be stopped again. But why do you fear for him, for my master? Have you walked the dream road and seen evil signs? By starlight, I could just make out Inaluki slowly shaking his head. I do not need the road of dreams to see the signs. They are all around us. Look at this place. It is like the hall of death itself beyond the veil. Black birds of ill omen all around us. And this empty, blighted land. For a moment, I thought, remind himself of the ultimate fate of all our kind, the master of this house has even surrounded himself with the mortals who will take our land from us one day. I do not understand you, my lord. The mortals. He turned to me, as if only just remembering that I was present in the flesh, not merely a voice in the darkness. Yes, the mortals, Armiger Pamon, the creatures that will one day own this entire world for themselves. Surely you can see that as clearly as I can. He laughed harshly then. After all, the elders say your race is rich in foresight. Perhaps so, but that gift has not been given to me. Being sharper and colder. And your brother may have gifted me with attention far beyond what I could have hoped for. But he would not listen to me if I told him to desert you. You know him, my lord. Once he has set his mind on something, that is that. Like you, Lord Inaluki, I thought, though Hakatri does not come to such a place so easily or so foolishly. Still, at the moment, though I fiercely resented what Inaluki had done to my beloved master, I could not be too angry with him. His regret over what he had set in motion was very clear. Can you truly not take back your oath? Again, Inaluki fell silent. Go now, he said at last. It was a mistake thinking you might understand. He made a curt gesture of dismissal. As I turned back toward the stairwell, the ravens in their stony refuge croaked in sleepy voices. A feeling like the thick-headedness of a fever rolled over me as I made my way down from the tower roof. If Inaluki himself could not change the course that fate would take, what had he expected of me? I wondered if he had spoken to me not because he thought I could truly persuade his brother to turn his back and return home, but because in some way I would now share the blame for whatever happened. 
I made a prayer to our garden then, sacred because it is both a place and an idea. Watch over my master. Do not let him lose his life in this terrible, needless pursuit because of a single vain, dangerous oath. Do not let Hakatri die. I often wondered in later days whether my prayer might have been to blame for what happened. I had become a little lost in the dark keep, uncertain which floor housed my master's chamber, when I heard soft footsteps. Turning a corner, I found myself face to face with a small, slight figure in a hooded robe, the same I had seen before in the stairwell. Her pale face was only partly visible. Still thinking it must be the mistress of the castle, I dropped to one knee. "'Forgive me, my lady,' I said. "'I did not mean to intrude on you earlier. I was on my way to the roof.' "'Ah, see!' she said. It is my lord errant returned. It was not the voice of Saru and Onya, Saru and Ona. I thank you for saving me from a difficult position, sir. As I stared at this stranger in surprise, I heard more footfalls behind me and turned to see Lady Ona herself approaching, dressed for bed but also wearing a heavy cloak. Raven's perch was a cold place at night. "'So I am not the only one who cannot sleep,' she said. "'Is this why you are so slow with your errand, Sholi?' "'I was hurrying back, my lady,' said the other woman. "'Then this fellow appeared out of nowhere and dropped down to his knees in front of me. "'He is quite the young gallant.' "'I realized I was still kneeling and rose. "'My apologies, Lady Ona,' I said. I lost myself coming back from walking in the night air. Then I mistook this lady for you. Do you see, Sholi? said Ona. A perfectly reasonable explanation. Now, did you bring me some wine, as I asked? Yes, my lady, the other woman said. The very last of the good red, I fear. We shall send for more when the next wagons come. Until then, we can make do with less noble vintages. She turned to me. Will you take a cup, Pamon Kess? Sholi here will be with us. You need not fear for your honor or good name. I was still shaken by my talk with Inaluki, but I could not easily think of a reason to turn down this kinswoman of mine, although in truth our first encounter had made me a bit fearful of her. That no doubt sounds strange, since she had said nothing to me that should have disturbed me much. Perhaps it was the sense that since we had left Azua to seek in Aluki, things normally hidden, and sensibly so, had risen too close to the surface to be safely ignored. I followed Lady Ona and Sholi down the hall to a retiring room. Ona lit the lamps with her own hand, then lowered the hood of her thick cloak to reveal her long, silvery hair let down for the night. Sholi vanished into the next chamber, but soon returned with three cups and an earthenware jug on a tray, which she set down on a small table. Then she shrugged off her own cloak to reveal a mass of loose, fair tresses. She was dressed in a thick sleeping robe with what looked like a fine nightdress, showing its hem beneath it. "'As you have likely noticed,' Ona said, "'when it is the hare's moon here on the beacon, it feels more like the wolf moon. My husband chose this place for its isolation, not its comforts. The cold has not troubled me, I told her, my second untruth of the hour. In fact, I had shivered through much of my conversation with Lord Inaluki, though not entirely because of the chilly air. <clears throat> Lady Ona poured the wine and passed the first cup to me, the next to the young woman. I had a chance to observe this Sholi more closely now, and though I did my best not to make it obvious, it was hard not to stare at her. Where Lady Ona's features were fine, her nose prominent, her cheekbones and jaw so precisely defined, she might have been of my master's people, Sholi was quite different. She had round cheeks flushed from the first sips of wine, 
or perhaps from escaping the cold corridor, and her nose turned up a little at the end, which gave her a mischievous appearance. But, at the same time, something in her wide-set eyes and pale golden complexion, not to mention her long slender fingers wrapped around the cup, made me certain that this Sholi was Tanuka Daya, just like Lady Ona, and just like me. "'You are correct,' said Ona, as if she could hear my unspoken thoughts. "'My lady-in-waiting is also one of the ocean children, like us. "'She is of the Tour clan.' "'Not precisely like you, my lady,' Sholi said easily. "'She was a good deal younger than Lady Ona. "'That was clear from her skin and her speech. "'But she seemed to treat Ona as an equal. "'My family are Shavau.' "'I did not know the word.' Ona saw my confusion, smiled, and gently said, "'Our new friend, Kess, does not speak the old tongue, Sholi.' "'Truly?' The surprised look she gave me made me freshly ashamed. "'Forgive me, then. My people are of the sea-watchers.' "'Niskis?' I was more startled by this than she had been at my ignorance. This Sholi did not show the signs I was familiar with from the sea-watchers I knew— her arms seemed no longer than mine, or Lady Ona's, and I saw none of the usual roughness on her skin. "'Are you from the South?' Sholi laughed. "'No, and glad not to be. Our people along the southern coasts are strange and inbred. My family is among the last of its kind still in the North. I come from the town of Dayoshoga, Goblin Rock.' I had heard of it, a good-sized settlement along the coast west of the Sunstep Mountains. In recent years, both the Zedaya and Tanuka Daya have largely been replaced there by mortal herdsmen, and Dayoshoga had become a busy port town. The mortals call it Kranhir, a name whose meaning I do not know, but it has always been a strange place, where many sorts of folk came together and many kinds of trade took place— some less wholesome than others. I felt out of my depth at first to be sitting with these two members of my own race, though they might... Oh, sorry. I felt out of my depth at first to be sitting with these two members of my own race, though they might be. Of course, I was a resident of the great court at Azwa, so I assumed that was the reason for their interest. Instead, though, the two women seemed fixed on me, Armager Pamon rescued me from a bad moment, Sholi announced. He spoke up to one of his masters, who was paying me uncomfortable attention, which gave me a chance to escape. She turned to me. It was not what it seemed, though. Lord Inaluki was asking questions about my lady's husband, Lord Zaniko, and I did not think I should answer them. Your arrival was still most appreciated. I Inaluki is not my master, but my master's brother, I said. In any case, though, you give me too much credit, my lady. I turned to Ona. I merely gave Inaluki a message from Lord Hakatri. Yes, I think I heard them talking about it as I passed your master's room, said Lady Ona, smiling. Hakatri was saying that the message was wrong, and that he was not intending to speak to Inaluki this night. There, said Sholi, I was right. This Pamon is a true Lord Errant, rescuing the innocent. I was still so bothered by deceiving my master's brother that I could not much enjoy their banter. Lord Inaluki can be heedless, said Sholi. The mistress of Raven's Perch turned to me. Are you one of those who sees only good in others, Kess? That can be a kind of blindness that endangers you more than those you defend. I think you see altogether more things in me, Lady Ona, for good and for bad, than a life like mine warrants. So you did not try to help Sholi. I was uncomfortable. Are you asking me to speak ill of my master's brother, my lady? She stared for a moment, her yellow eyes fierce even by candlelight. At last she reached out and patted my hand. 
Of course not. But on Sholey's behalf, I still thank you. A little flustered by so much attention, I let the mistress of Ravensperch turn the subject to less complicated things, questions about Azua and its leading family. I have always wanted to meet the Saansra, Lady Amarasu, Ona said. I hear that even those who are not of her own year-dancing clan call her first grandmother. Was she truly born on one of the great ships? asked Sholi. So it is said, and so I believe. And is she as wise as all the tales of her say? I smiled. Here I will have no trouble speaking. I have never met anyone like her. Amarasu's patience, her wisdom, her love for her people, for all her kind, even Utuku's Hikidaya folk, are all remarkable. To me, she is like the dawn itself. If you had never seen it, you would think the tales of its magnificence were exaggerated. But the first time you saw the night retreat and the sun rise, you would know you had not understood the truth until that moment. Sholi laughed and clapped her hands. My lord Errant is also a poet. Ona was again looking at me intently. And is she as good to the Tanukadaya of Azua as she is to her own folk? She has never treated me with anything but kindness and dignity, I said quickly. And your fellow, Tanukadaya, how is she to them? I hesitated, since my first reply had been warmer than I might have wished. I thought carefully about what I had seen of Lady Amarasu's dealings with my own folk. From what I have seen, she is as good to us as to her own kind. She was gracious with the mortal visitors as well, the mortals for whose pleas for help started us on this journey. Ah, yes, tell us more about that, said Ona. My husband has barely spoken to me since you came, so what brings you here is still much a mystery. I know only that it has to do with a dragon. Lady Sholi wrapped her cloak tighter. I am not sure I want to hear about dragons, not in the middle of the night. I begged her pardon, but then did my best to relate what had happened since we left Azua. I did not dwell too long or too deeply on the death and mayhem our company had suffered in Serpent's Vale. That is why we came to your husband, the famous dragon slayer, I finished. My masters want to end the menace of the black worm. I cannot even hear that name without shuddering, said Sholi. Ona patted her hand. Then let us change the conversation. Tell us more about Azua, Kes. As you know, we do not hear much news and a few more stories about Azua and other places I had seen in my master's company, but did not say much about the disaster in Serpent's Vale or in Aluki's Pledge. The two women gave me the courtesy of listening attentively, and I even made Sholi laugh a few times, which is quite a char which was quite a charming thing to hear, a flurry of silvery notes like the splashing of a mountain stream. Once she laughed so hard that she had to reach out and clutch my arm for support. I found myself responding both in my flesh and in my feelings, and I could have happily remained longer in such pleasant company but then I remembered my duties. I drank off the last of my cup, stood, and bowed. Lady Ona, Lady Sholi, I thank you for your hospitality. My master usually rises early. If I do not sleep a little, I will be small use to him. Of course, Ona said. Sholi, will you walk our new friend Kess to the door? Certainly, my lady. She rose to accompany me. A Niski, I thought as I watched her. Does she often think of the sea? Long for it? Or is she, like me, content with where she is and the life she has been given? As we reached the door of the retiring room, Sholi smiled and said, My thanks again for your gallantry. I hope we will see more of you, Armiger. I bowed once more and took my leave, though I was too enlivened by both the wine and the company to sleep 
for some time afterward. We stayed at Raven's Perch for some time, deep in conversation with Lord Zanico. They even made drawings, as though working out the plan of a battle, which, I suppose, was exactly what they were doing. In Aluki, as was often the case, even at home in Azua, seemed to lose interest in the planning before too long, and took his horse bronze to ride the mountain paths instead. By the third day we spent on the beacon, he would be out from early morning until almost dark. Inaluki always had that streak of impatience. I think if he had been with anyone other than his brother, he would have insisted we leave, though it was his own, his own ill-starred oath that had brought us to this icy mood, he remained deferential to Hakatri. As for me, I spent many hours over that span, talking with kind Lady Ona and clever Lady Sholi. I could not guess what they liked about my company, but I was happy to provide it to them, since my master required little from me while we remained atop the beacon. "'You must forgive me for taking up so much of your time,' the mistress of the house told me one day. "'I love and honor my husband very much, but still pine for company. "'I knew Zaniko was of a solitary temperament, even when I first met him, "'and I knew it even better by the time we wed, but I confess the solitude began to wear on me. "'In truth, it was Zaniko himself who suggested I invite Sholi.' to be my companion. Invite! I was all but kidnapped, Sholi said, with a smile to show she jested. But the garden is my witness when I say I found life rather dull in my father's house and did not resist much. I enjoyed my time with the two ladies very much, but there were still moments I felt myself to be at a disadvantage. I was never certain whether they actually enjoyed conversing with me or if I was an object of interest because Ona was fascinated, or frustrated, with my ignorance of our shared heritage. At first we spoke mostly of the simple things of everyday life at Raven's Perch, trying to find a sunny spot for Lady Ona's garden, or Sholi's pampered cat, Lambkin, and his life-and-death battles against aggressive ravens. But sometimes Ona gave me little lessons about our Tanukadaya people and their long history, a history usually hidden beneath the shadows of our Kedaya masters, both Hakatri's people and Zaniko's death-pale folk. Of course, my father had told me almost none of this, if he, if he had even known it. One day, as I told them of the way the Tanukadaya co-ruler was treated in Mezutua, I saw Ona's face grow somber. That is not the worst thing that has been done to our folk, she said, but it truly is one of the most shameless. Inazashi could not simply push the Tanukadaya out, for many reasons. Our people are too necessary to the mines and other things Silverhome needs, but Inazashi has made certain they have no power. The spark in her eyes looked dangerous. You saw Kai Unyu, that poor gelded creature, he and his wife were once leaders of our folk in Mezutua, but now they are nothing but Inazashi's puppets. Mark my words, a struggle will come one day, and I fear it will be a bloody one. You cannot hold a people down forever. This kind of talk for the Tanukadaya of Silverhome. If such a struggle happened, Inazashi, I felt sure, would be remorseless in his dealings with any threat to his rule. But I also wondered what would happen if such unrest spread to Azua and other Zedaya settlements. I did not think Tanukadaya were anywhere near strong enough to overthrow their masters, but I feared what such a struggle might do to the long bond between my folk and my lords. And what of me? I thought. Surely I would have to side with my master's people if Hakatri and his kin were in danger but against my own race? These thoughts disturbed me, and kind Sholi seemed to sense it. Let us talk of something else, she said brightly. It is a fine day, 
It seems a shame to waste it on such sad things. We could walk on the battlements. Lady Ona waved her hand. You go, dear Sholi. Take our new friend Kess out and let him breathe the air. I'm tired, but I will join you later. As I look back now, it seems clear that the two women were conducting a careful campaign. But, as has sadly often been the case, I was slow to grasp the truth. In any case, Sholi and I were about to be alone together for the first time, still brisk, and our cloaks billowed as we walked along the walls. Below us lay the forested skirts of the beacon, and beyond them the hilly meadowlands spread in all directions, lush with the greenery of renewal season. "'You look gloomy, Kess,' Sholi said. "'Are you downhearted about your master and his brother?' I was still unused to being addressed by my own name, and it seemed even stranger from the lips of someone I considered above me in station. I fear for them both, of course, Lady Sholi, and myself too, I suppose, since I am bound to my Lord Hakatri wherever he goes. Why? For a moment I could not understand the reason for her question, since the answer seemed so obvious. Why? I said at last. Because I am sworn to him, of course. I am bound for life to his household. He chose me for a great honor. Being his servant. His armiger. I felt a need to defend myself. The first of our race ever to be given that privilege. To be treated almost like one of the Zediah themselves. I can never forget that. I was nettled that she could not understand it. And you? Could you leave Lady Ona? She gave me a hurt look, as though I had changed the rules of a game without warning. She would be alone here if I did, with no one of her own kind to share her exile. Saniko is a good husband in most ways, but he is also full of brooding silences that can last for whole seasons. So... Perhaps our loyalties are not so different, I said. And in that instant, I still believed. Then, as we stood in the swirling breeze in that high place, she asked me, So you owe your master everything, Kess? Even your chance for some happiness of your own? Surprised by her tone, I looked at her and suddenly realized what I should have seen long before— Sholi was not merely interested in me because I was from Azua, a guest to their backwater castle who could tell stories of the great court. A surge of feelings washed through me then, but they were as mixed as the convergence of several streams, some muddy, some clear. In the past I had known a few women of my own race to look on me with favor, but always, I assumed, because of my rarefied position as Hakatri's squire. This seemed different. I was flattered and moved by Sholi's interest in me, of course, but also saddened, because I had told her the truth. I could not leave my master without betraying my honor. Of course, callow as I was, I saw the contradiction even then. The same sort of honor has thrown Inaluki and my master into terrible straits, I reminded myself. The same honor may kill all three of us in the end, and who knows how many more. And Sholi is bound by honor too, though of a slightly different kind. But I only said to her, The garden does not always give us what we want in life, Lady Sholi. After that we both fell silent lost in our thoughts, brooding over things that could not easily or happily be spoken aloud. Lady Ona did not come to join us, and at last we went down out of the wind. "'Are you learning much from Lord Zaniko?' I asked my master on the third night atop the beacon. As might be guessed, I was hungry for distraction. "'Yes, I am, Pamon. About many things. He has a thousand stories to tell of the Hikidaya court, some that amuse, many that horrify. 
I was under the impression, I said carefully, that we came here to learn about killing one of the great worms. Hakatri smiled. Oh, we have spoken much of that, do not doubt. In truth, I have learned what I need. I expect we will ride out tomorrow, so be ready before the sun drives the heart from the sky. We will have a long ride back to Mien, he checked himself, back to Hearn's land. So we are going back there? I said, trying to hide my apprehension. I will go to the castle kitchens then and see what I can get from them for our journey and afterward. How long will we stay among the mortals? Long enough to kill a dragon, I hope. But though his voice was light, his statement hung in the air between us. I could think of nothing to say at first, so great was my unease at the idea of hunting the worm of Serpent's Vale or even approaching that deadly spot again. May the garden keep you and your brother safe, was what I finally summoned. The past few days of rest and comfort had allowed me to pretend that we were only on another journey, another hunt, but my master and I both knew that was not the truth. As I was finishing the last of my arrangements for our departure, I encountered Lady Ona, by accident, as it seemed, she was sewing in the antechamber outside the castle's main hall, and she rose as I passed through it. Armiger Pamun Kess, she said, I hear that you and the two Sansere lords are leaving us. I bowed. So it seems, my lady. We have enjoyed meeting you. The we she spoke of must mean herself and Sholi, I guessed, since I doubted Zaniko would even remember me. Perhaps we may hope to see you back at Raven's Perch again one day? She tipped her head a little at that, as if looking to see something confirmed that she had only heard about. I bowed, suddenly weary with my muddle of feelings. If my master's service brings me back here, it would make me very happy, Lady Ona. This was not mere courtliness on my part. It had been a rare and pleasurable thing to be sought for my own company, not just because of my master's high name. In the last hours of dark, one of Lord Zaniko's guardsmen brought my master an earthenware jar, handling it with exaggerated care as though it contained some dangerous living creature. Hakatri put it in a leather sack and hung it on his saddle. He and his brother were both more silent than usual, as though neither had spent a restful night. A short time later, we rode out into the dawning light, the evergreen trees of the mountaintop gleaming around us in the early sun like icicles turned upside down. As we rode, along the edge, rode back along the edge of the mountains, the brothers did not speak much, either to me or each other. I suspected they had fought again over Inaluki's oath. When we struck the wide silver way, we turned and followed it northwest. At the end of the day, we reached the, the road that led to Snowdrift, Lord Dunyadi's house on Birch Hill, where a small group of my master's people had settled near the confluence of two important rivers, the Great Redwash and the Mountain's Milk. To our surprise, we found someone waiting there on horseback. And that's where we are going to stop. Um, because we're pretty much out of time and it starts a whole new section. I thought there was actually a break there, but there wasn't. So let me just make sure we're still running up, running, 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 running. All right. Um, and uh, so hello, everybody who's arrived after I said hello to the whole group, first group. Um, and so I will quickly say hello to you, Tracy. Hello, Tracy. Tracy McClatchy showed up. And who else? Christy Sanders showed up. And Tiffany Perry. And Tash. Hello. And did I get everybody? Okay, well, that's everybody who checked in. So with that, um, I am going to wrap it up. I will be back next week. Um, same time, same bat time, same bat channel. And I will be uh, reading, continuing from where we stopped. And as usual, I thank you all for the pleasure of your company. 
and for giving me an excuse to do this and uh, for <laughs> sharing this little bit of domesticity when my terrified hound comes in and shoves his face into my lap in the middle of a reading or when our little irritating chihuahua comes in and yips and yaps to let me know that he is momentarily without a human being to wait on him. Um, anyway, so you, I appreciate being able to share these domestic moments with you. Take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your friends and loved ones and those around you when you can. Not all of us have it so good. Again, be well, and I will see you very soon. Peace and good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Thanks.